Let's um, start the recording, uh, Kristen. And uh, welcome everybody. Uh, how to avoid going broke in the nursing home. You know, my name is David Wingate. Thank you so much for listening to this uh, at this moment, or if you're going to be listening to it in uh, any time at two o'clock in the morning, if you can't sleep or whatever. Okay. So. Um, Basically, what we're going to do is go is going going through this. So, what's the risk of uh, you ending up in a nursing home? Well, basically, about seventy percent over the age of sixty-five will require some type of long-term care during their lifetime. And if we look at the uh, bottom, twenty percent, if you're sixty-five, will need care for more than five years. Now, obviously, you know, as we grow older, uh, then that, that increases because it used to be that, you know, back in the 50s, 60s or 70s, like it was like my grandfather, he retired at 75, at 65. He got bored. He went back to work. He worked till he was 70 and he passed away at, at 71. But now everybody's living to their 80s, 90s, and sometimes we're living well into our hundreds. So obviously, as we get older, we need more uh, help, whether it's going to be at home and assisted living or in the nursing home. Um, so most of uh, Medicaid or long term care is due to dementia. Um, so that's that's what we're finding. And the dementia can range from four to eight years after a diagnosis, but it might take 20 years. I might have dementia now uh, because sometimes I forget where I'm putting my keys or my wallets or whatever. So is that part of aging or is that part of dementia? Right this moment in time, I don't know um, unless I, you know, went for some scans or whatever. But usually, you know, once it gets really bad, then, you know, diagnosis is, you know, four to eight years. And so with the nursing home and, and Medicaid and medical assistance, there's a whole bunch of myths out there. And one of the reasons that we're doing this is that we want to dispel these myths. So one of the first myths that, you know, that we come across is it's illegal to give money away. So because people say, well, I've got to go to the nursing home. I've got to give all my nurse all my money to the nursing home before I go in. That's crazy. You do not have to do that. And then if you're married, one of the biggest fears of our married couple is so if my husband or my wife goes into a nursing home, my other spouse who's living in the home is going to lose our home. That is not correct. That's a big myth. And as I say, you know, we do not have to spend all our assets on the, in the nursing home because there is things that you can do to protect your assets. You don't have to give everything to the nursing home. And also another huge myth is, well, I can't do anything because I'm going into the nursing home tomorrow or next week and I didn't do things a long time ago. I didn't do things more than five years ago. Well, once again, that's a myth. Even if you're in the nursing home or about to go into a nursing home, there's things that we can do to protect your assets. So that's why I'm here to dispel some of these myths. One of, another myth is that Medicaid or Medicare, sorry, Medicare pays for long-term care. Medicare does not pay for long-term care. It only pays for rehab. So, Let's say I slip and fall and break my hip or break my leg and I end up going to the hospital. I have a couple of nights. Um, it used to be three, three nights, but with COVID, it's just a couple of days, one, one day. But traditionally, it was three overnights. If I have three overnights in the hospital, then I go to the nursing home for rehabilitation. Medica Medicare will pay 100% up for the first 20 days. Then from 21 days to 100, you're on a copay. And so it's either coming out of your pocket or if you have supplemental insurance, uh, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, um, you know, uh, the, these type of um, Humana, those type of supplemental insurances, then the supplemental insurance will pick up 
the difference. But the maximum that you can get is 100 days. So if you're in there for 100 days, and then you go to 101, the 101st day, you're going to be on private pay between 10 and $15,000 a month. Now, you're not guaranteed those 100 days because let's say that uh, after 35 days, you stop doing your physical therapy. And if Medicare stops paying, so will your supplemental insurance. So one of the other things is that you think if you've got what we call the supplemental insurance or Medigap insurance is going to cover long-term care. It does not cover long-term care. It only will cover what Medicare doesn't cover, okay? So once again, so Medic, uh, your Medicare will cover 100% up for 20 days, then from 21 to 100. Medicare basically covers about 80%. And then if you've got Medigap supplemental insurance, that will cover the 20%. However, if Medicare stops paying, so does the supplemental insurance. So that's a big myth. Another big myth is care is not as good under Medicaid as it is under uh, private pay. The, you know, my uh, analogy is it's like, a, you, know, the, uh, you know, people think of Medicaid when you go to the nursing homes, like a Stephen King movie that you, you drive up to the, uh, the nursing home and you're opening the door and it's squeaking and it's dark and the lights are, you know, um, dimming. And um, however, if you go to the private area, it's full of life and full of, of people. You, you know, the, the staff can't discriminate between you on Medicaid and you on private pay. They don't know. So you get your the same care in the same facility, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Okay. Now, all the nursing homes, most of the nursing homes uh, in uh, Washington County, Frederick County, and Montgomery County, or in, in Maryland, uh, take Medicaid. Okay. Now, if you hear the word medical assistance, Medical assistance is the term that we use here in Maryland for Medicaid. So if you hear medical assistance, it's Medicaid, or sometimes people talk about Medicaid, it's medical assistance. But, you know, as I say, I'm going to reiterate, the care is exactly the same. Okay. As I talked right at the beginning, you know, I must give everything to the nursing home. Well, with proper planning, you can utilize uh, Medicaid medical assistance and save your assets. So what's your exposure really right at this moment in time? So let, the average stay in a nursing home is approximately four years. The average cost of a nursing home in this area is about $12,000 a month. There's some places a little bit less. There's some places a little bit more. So four years times 12 months times 12,000 is well over half a million dollars, $576,000. For most people, that will wipe you out. So the problem is then what can we do, you know, for your loved ones, for your spouse? Because if you spend $576,000 over four years and you've got no money left for your, for your loved ones or your family, then that becomes problematic because we see this all the time. That sometimes, you know, the husband goes into the nursing home, they private pay and all the money disappears. And then this, you know, the wife, you know, is now in her late 80s or 90s or whatever, and she's run out of money. And then how do you pay for, um, you know, care? Because, you know, we just had a lady in the other day there, she's got 2,200 bucks, in um, pension and social security, and she has no money left. How is she going, sh she's starting to fail. How is she going to pay for home care? Because the home care is about $25 an hour, and you're not going to get very much home care, you know, for 2,200 bucks. So that's why we need to try and protect your assets from the nursing home to take care of you, and also sometimes, you know, leave, leave a legacy for your family. 
So, you know, the other myth that we talked about is that we can't give money away. Yes, you can. It's not illegal and it's not immoral. We just need to do proper planning because as we'll find out is when you give money away, it has ramifications, especially when you're going to apply for Medicaid because we're going to look, we're going to talk about this five year look back period. Okay. And if you give money away, it can cause problems if you're trying to get Medicaid. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Now, one of the big things, even though that your husband and wife or partner or your children or families, you can't sometimes go in there and just take money away and gift it to, to someone else, okay? especially if you have an IRA, 401ks, what we call qualified money, that your loved one, your family members can't even talk to a financial advisor to say, hey, we want to transfer this money from X to Y. So that's why we need these what we call power of attorneys. There's two types of power of attorney. One's a financial power of attorney, and we call that a durable power of attorney. The durable power of attorney is a financial power of attorney. And there's also a medical power of attorney, and that's to deal with your health and welfare. Now, if you don't have those power of attorneys, you need to get them. Those two power of attorneys are the most critical documents you can get because we're dealing with you while you're still alive. Now, you know, when you die, your power of attorneys die with you, and then that's when you go into, you know, your wills and trusts, okay? But it's very, very important. If you have a financial, if you don't have a financial power of attorney, you've got to get one. If you do have a financial power of attorney, I want you to review it because you've got to have what we call a gifting clause. So in your financial power of attorney, you've got to have a gifting clause that allows your agent to make gifts them to themselves or to other family members. And if that's not in there, that's going to give us problems down the road because maybe we can't give money away, okay? So how do we do that? How can we give money away? Well, that's when we have to come up with the asset protection plan. So that's what we do. So let's say that you, you or your loved one, um, you know, you're maybe in your, uh, you know, late 60s, 70s, 80s, or even in your 90s, you're thinking, you know, what's going to happen to me? What happens if I go into a nursing home? Well, then that's where we have to come up with a plan. How can we plan, you know, to protect your assets from the nursing home? because basically we have two planning strategies. One is what we call a pre-crisis planning, and the other one is what we call a crisis plan, okay? So the crisis plan is, hey, I'm going into the nursing home tomorrow. I haven't done anything, you know, I don't have my financial power of attorneys. I haven't, you know, I haven't planned in any way. Well, we're in a crisis. So we've got to get power of attorneys, we've got to get wills, we've got to come up with a plan. We've got to, uh, you know, implement that plan. And so, I mean, we're in a crisis mode. The other one is what we call a pre-crisis mode. And the pre-crisis mode is, well, I'm in my 60s or 70s, I'm going to come up with a plan if I'm going to go into a nursing home. So that's when we can start coming up with um certain types of trusts. Most people have what we call a revocable trust, but revocable trust really only protects your assets. You know, it doesn't protect your assets, only it avoids probate. It does not protect your assets because with a revocable trust, you can reach into that revocable trust and get your money. So if you can reach into that trust, so can the nursing home, so can the state. So the revocable trust does not protect your assets from the nursing home. All it does is avoid uh, probate. Um, however, that's where we have what we call an irrevocable trust, irrevocable. And with the irrevocable trust, once you put something into it, you cannot get at it. 
okay? So if I set up my irrevocable trust for me, I'm the owner of the trust. I then can take monies or my house, for, well, that's what we do for a lot of people, and move it from me into my trust, the irrevocable trust. So once it's in there, I can't reach in there and get it. If I can't get it, neither can the nursing home. However, there is ways that your children or whoever we call the trustee, the manager of the trust, can reach in there and get that money. However, the whole idea is just to put a certain amount of money in there or your properties in there and just leave it in there for you. The only caveat is, is once you put something in there, you have to get through five years. So if I set up my trust today, here we are in 2020, and I move my house into the trust, and let's say I move $100,000 into the trust. So come 2026, I've got over the five-year period. So now my house and that $100,000 is protected from the nursing home. Now, let's say two years from now, would be 2022, I put another $50,000 into that trust. Now, so then that $50,000 will not be pr protected for another five years. So in 2027, that $50,000 would be protected. However, you know, as of, you know, the house and the other $100,000, is protected after you know 20 you know after the five years so come 2026 it be protected so there's a whole bunch of yeah i'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on uh, you know power of attorneys the revocable trusts the irrevocable trusts um i just want to bring that up we're actually going to have another um webinar uh, i think i believe it's next week or something or next couple of weeks that we can let you know and i'm going to spend more time on the estate planning side of the asset protection planning setting up revocable trusts setting up uh, irrevocable trusts okay so a lot of times that people say well i can transfer my assets to avoid medicaid and that's what we were talking about. So what happens if I transfer my house, you know, to my son or my daughter, or I just give them, uh, you know, $100,000, okay? Now, let's say that you give your uh, house and money to your son or daughter or whatever. Well, what happens if they go bankrupt? What happens if they get divorced? Maybe you like your daughter-in-law or son-in-law right at this moment in time, but what happens if they get you, you, your your loved one gets divorced from them, and they're going after your money as part of a divorce sell, settlement, alimony, etc. What happens if your son or daughter gets in a terrible car crash and they end up going into uh, get, getting sued, a lawsuit, and causes foreclosures? Or what happens if, if they pass away? And if they pass away, then your money might go to your son-in-law or daughter-in-law. Or what happens if they end up going into the nursing home? So that's why we don't like transferring assets to your children. That's why we prefer to have the irrevocable trust. We can transfer the stuff to the irrevocable trust and we still have control of it, okay? And once we can get through that five years, it's protected. Because if you do not get through the five years, then that causes major, major issues, especially if you're gifting. So basically what the state does, Medicaid does, for every $9,673 that you gift away, that creates one month of penalty once you qualify for Medicaid. Now, so let's say I'm a single person. Now for me to qualify, and we'll talk about this next couple of slides, to qualify for Medicaid, I've got to be in a nursing home. I've got to be sick, can't do activities of daily living or need skilled care. 
and my assets as a single person has to be below $2,500. That's my checking, savings, etc. Now, let's say I meet all those criteria and I apply for Medicaid. Yes, I will get Medicaid, but what the state does, state Medicaid people, they go back five years to see what you did. And let's say that you're making gifts to your children to help them out to buy a house, pay off their credit cards, help them you know, with your grandchildren to pay education, um, those things. So let's say that over the last five years, you've given away $100,000 to your children and grandchildren, nieces, nephews, or anybody. So what the state does is they take that $100,000 and divide it by that $9,673, which is an arbitrary number from the state. And say that's the average cost of a nursing home. Um, so they divide that 100,000 by approximately the 10,000. That creates a 10 month penalty period. So what that means is, yes, you qualify for Medicaid. However, you will not get Medicaid for 10 months because you've gifted that money away. Now, if your social security and pension is 2000 bucks a month, how are you going to pay the $12,000 nursing home bill? And the nursing home's not going to be very happy and try and kick you out. Now, what happens if you went into a nursing home and you didn't sign the nursing home contract, but your son or daughter did? And they signed as the guarantor. Now, you can't pay that hundred thousand dollars you know because you've got no money left you've only got that twenty five hundred plus your two thousand dollar income but the nursing home wants to get paid now the nursing home is going to go after your son and daughter for that hundred thousand dollars because they signed as the guarantor meaning if you couldn't pay they will pay for it so that's a big problem that's why, remember, we were talking about financial power of attorneys? Very, very important. So if your son or daughter had to sign the nursing home contract because you couldn't sign it, if they sign as a power of attorney, they're not responsible for that $100,000 because they're working as your agent. So that's when I talk about financial power of attorneys are really, really important, okay? So, what are potential nursing home assets? Basically, everything that you have, everything that you've worked for all your life, cash, checking, savings, CDs, stocks, bonds, you know, your home, your real property. As I mentioned earlier, even monies in or anything in a revocable trust. The rev revocable trust does not protect your assets. I can't tell you how many people come in and say, hey, I've got a revocable trust. I'm, I'm protected from the nursing home because I've got this revocable trust. No, no, it's not because you can get at that money. Well, the other thing is, well, I've got a joint account with my son. You know, I've got $100,000, you know, that's protected. No, it's not protected. That $100,000 is up for grabs for Medicaid. Unless your son can prove he gave you the $100,000. Any retirement accounts that you have, 401ks, IRAs, Ross, they're all what we call countable assets. Even your life insurance. And so there's two types of life insurance. One is term. Life insurance, so if I have a $50,000 term life insurance policy, I, there, there, it has no value until I die. So basically Medicaid says that that has a zero, zero, um, you know, a zero countable asset, okay? There, there's no money in it unless I die. The other one is what we call whole life. So if I have a $50,000, death benefit, but I can cash that $50,000 out. And I let's say I receive $15,000 if I cash it out, then Medicaid is going to count that $15,000 as an asset. 
and also vehicles and homes can be what we call countable assets as well. So everything that you have is a countable asset as far as Medicaid is concerned, and they're going to go after all of your money. So what happens if I'm a single person? We sort of touched, touched on this very briefly. So how do I qualify as a single person? Okay. My, you know, for, for me, I'm going to use this as an example uh, that, well, my wife hasn't passed away yet, but assuming that my, my, my spouse has passed away, I'm a single person and I start to fail and I've got to go into a nursing home. So I have to be in a nursing home. The reason I'm in a nursing home is because I'm sick, I need skilled care, or I can't do at least two to three activities of daily living. And I, all my assets have to be below $2,500 to qualify for Medicaid. So got to be in a nursing home. I can't get Medicaid at home. Can't get Medicaid in an assisted living facility. You got to be in a nursing home in Maryland to get uh, Medicaid. Okay. Now there there is um, five thousand slots. Okay, that you can get Medicaid at home or in a, assisted living, but there's approximately thirty thousand people on the waiting list. And we're projecting it's about five years, you know, for those 30,000 to get on the uh, down to, you know, that 5,000 slot. So as far as I'm concerned, really, you know, the, the only time that you can get Medicaid is if you're on, in the nursing home. OK, now, so what are exempt assets for a single person? Basically, whatever you can put in to a nursing home room. Maybe you'll get a TV, you know, maybe a, a chair, a recliner. You probably allowed, you know, some jewelry. And then your exempt assets of 2,500 bucks. You are allowed to prepay your funeral and have a burial plot because the government doesn't want to pay for that. And that's it. All your other assets have to get spent down. So if you have $100,000, that $100,000 has to get spent down to below $2,500. So 10 months at 10 grand is $100,000. So I'm in the nursing home, I'm sick. My $100,000 has been spent down below 2,500 bucks. I now qualify for Medicaid. Medicaid will pay for the nursing home. My medication, doctor's bills basically pays for everything. Uh, however, you know, my income will then go to the nursing home. So if I have social security or a pension, that all goes to the nursing home. However, out of my income, I am allowed to keep $83 per month. Now, what the heck can you get for $83? It doesn't even cover the basic cable. And then, so that's where you are. So, you know, you're in the nursing home. You've got less than 2,500 bucks. What happens if you need hearing aids? What happens if you need glasses? Medicaid doesn't pay for those. Medicare doesn't pay for that, but you've got 83 bucks a month. So how much is, are hearing aids? $5,000. So you go to you knock on the doctor's door and say, hey, I need a $5,000 hearing aid. And they say, well, okay, well, how much money do you have? Well, I've got a hundred bucks in my checking account because I'm on Medicaid. So do you think the doctor is going to take 80 bucks a month for the next 10 years or whatever? I don't think so. So that's why we have to protect your assets even for you. Because what happens if you end up going into a nursing home? What happens if you need to watch cable? What happens if you need a television? What happens if you need glasses? What happens if you need a hearing aid, etc.? So basically, exempt assets are zero, you know, really for a single person. 
but you say, well, what happens with my house? I've got a house. Well, Medicaid can't force you to sell the house. However, what they will do is they will put liens against that home. So, for it, you know, you know, whatever they spend on Medicaid for you, then they'll put that a lien against the home. So let's say that you're in there for four years and Medicaid spends $450,000 on you and your house is worth $300,000. They put a $450,000 lien on your home. So when you die, they will take that $300,000. So they don't take it up front, but they will get it in the end. So here's a single person example. So let's talk about, you've got a $250,000 home, a $10,000 car, $100,000 in an IRA, $50,000 in a savings account, and $10,000 in a checking account. So when we add all of those assets up, we call these countable assets, and your countable assets are $420,000. So total countable assets are $420,000. You're allowed to keep up to $2,500. So 420 minus 2,500. So the potential amount of assets to the nursing home in Maryland is $417,500. So you imagine you've worked all your life, paid taxes, been a good, you know, never get into any trouble. It's pretty bad that you you know you know all you've got to show for it is less than twenty five hundred pounds. Okay, so that's the single person. What about a married couple? Well, it's a little bit better. I'm not saying that you should run out if you're a single person, run out and get married. Okay, um, but you know, obviously, if you are married, then there are some exempt assets for a married couple. Okay. So let's say my wife is in the nursing home and I'm living in my home. I'm what we call the community spouse. So I'm allowed to preserve that home for my benefit. But what I definitely want to do is take my wife's name off of that because God forbid I die. If we're in both of her names, then she gets it. Now she's now that potential is that she's a single person with a home. And then the state's going to go after the home when she dies. Okay. Now, another exempt asset for a married couple is that they want to keep you with one car. So you know, the way I look at it is that you've got to go and visit your, your loved one in the nursing home and take care of them. Because most nursing homes don't take care of the loved ones. And, you know, just like the single person, you can prepay your funeral and uh, have a burial plot. Now, your prepaid funeral it has to be a, what we call a irrevocable contract. So once you hand over the $10,000 to the funeral home, you can't get it back. It's just like the irrevocable trust. Once you pay it, you can't get it back. Then the, um, that prepaid funeral is a non-countable asset. You're also allowed to keep personal property as a married couple. You know, that, that means all your furnishings pictures, silverware, whatever you have in your home. And then this is where it gets a little bit complicated because then basically you have half of your assets up to $126,000 approximately. So what do I mean by that? So in Maryland, whether it, 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 the assets are titled in your name, your spouse's name, or joint, they're all pulled together, okay? So if I have $100,000 in my name, my wife has $100,000 in her name, and we have $50,000 in joint names, we have a total of $250,000.
And so it doesn't matter whether it's just in my name, when my wife goes into the nursing home, Medicaid pulls it all together, okay? And I'm gonna give you an example of you know, the, the um, married couple. And so half of the assets up to 126,000. So that's the ceiling, the maximum I can keep as the community spouse is 126,000. All other assets can go to the nursing home if you don't plan. So let me give you an example. So the married couple example is, so the, the husband, me and my wife own the home, 250,000, we own a joint car, and we have a checking account of 50,000. So it's owned by husband and wife. Once again, I said, you know, so what's ever mine and my wife's, they're joined together. I also say have an IRA of 150,000 and my wife has an IRA of 100,000. I can't go to Medicaid and say, hey, Medicaid, my $150,000 is just in my name only. Get your hands off of it. In Maryland, it's lumped together. So the first husband and wife, the husband and wife is all lumped together. So what we can do is break out what we call the non-countable assets. If we remember, the home is a non-countable asset because I'm living in it. Now, if I am still have the home and I'm in an assisted living facility or in a nursing home, I'm not living at that home. So that home is a countable asset. It's not a non-countable asset because I'm not living in it. And also we talked about, you know, you're allowed to have a car. So I'm allowed to have the $10,000 car to drive up to the nursing home. So countable assets, my IRA, my wife's IRA in her checking account of $50,000. So total countable assets are the 300,000. The total countable assets or 300,000 doesn't include the car. It doesn't include the home. So these $300,000 are what the nursing home and Medicaid can go after. So we have the total countable assets of 300,000. And what we do is we divide that 300,000 by two. So I get 150,000 and my wife gets $150,000. However, Marilyn comes back to me and says, hey, Mr. Wingate, you get far too much money. The maximum you can have is 126,000 bucks. So the difference then goes from me to my wife. I get 126. And now she gets her 150 plus the 24,000. Now, what happens if we have $200,000 in countable assets? Well, then we divide that by the 200,000 by two. 100,000 and 100,000. Now, I'm able to keep my 100,000 because it's less than the 126 but my wife gets the 100,000. It's not like if I've got 200, I get 126 and the remaining balance of what's that $74,000 goes to my wife. No, we split it in two. Like if we had $100,000 in countable assets, once again, we divide it by two. I get 50,000, she gets 50,000. I don't get to keep the 100,000 even though it's below the 126. We always divide it by two. So the 100,000 is 50 and 50, okay? So then, so what we have here is, so if we go back to that example, you know, the $300,000 uh, countable assets. So I, as the community spouse, am allowed to keep approximately 126,000 out of the 300,000. And now my nursing home spouse, my wife, has 174 
Now to qualify for Medicaid, we've got to spend that $174,000 down below $2,500. So 17 months at 10 grand is $170,000. And we spend some money in miscellaneous, so we spend one hundred and seven. We spend one hundred and seventy-three thousand dollars on the nursing home. Out of the one seventy-four, we're now at a thousand dollars. Now we qualify for Medicaid because my wife's in the nursing home. She is sick, and now she has a thousand dollars, which is below the twenty-five hundred. So she qualifies for for Medicaid. I'm allowed to keep my car. I'm allowed to keep the house and I keep up to the $126,000 in this example. Okay. So let me just go through that again. So we've got 300,000. I'm allowed to keep the 126 as I'm the community spouse. The difference between 126 and 300 is 174,000 that my spouse has. She then has to spend that $174,000 down below 2,500 bucks. And once she, she does that, when she pays the nursing home $174,000, then she goes on Medicaid. However, that's where we come in. Okay. Before I get that. Now, do you have to give this $174,000 to the nursing home? Well, that's when we come up with our asset protection strategies. Okay, how can we protect that $174,000 instead of giving it to the nursing home? How can I take that $174,000 that my wife has to spend down on the nursing home to below 2,500 bucks to qualify for Medicaid. I want to be able to take that 174 spend down and give it to me, the community spouse. And there is ways of doing that. We don't have to spend it all on the nursing home. I can take my 126 I can also take this nursing home spend down of $174,000 and not giving it to the nursing home, but giving it to me. So I've got my $300,000 and my wife qualifies for Medicaid. How do we do that? Well, it, it just depends because then that's when we have to come up with the asset protection plan to see what we can do. Now, this is where it, it gets crazy, you know. This is the story of, of two brothers. They were both veterans. These are not actual pictures of them. And one, you know, they were in both in Korea, and the one in the left ended up uh, suffering a massive heart attack, okay? Massive heart attack. He was airlifted down to D.C., went through heart surgery, rehabilitation, and now he's, you know, back back home. Now, the cost of that airlift, surgery, et cetera, was about $350,000, $400,000. Medicare paid for that. So, so think about that. Medicare paid for that $350,000, $400,000. The, the brother on the right hand side didn't suffer ma massive heart attack. He had dementia. What did Medicare and uh, Medicare pay for? Basically, you know, a, you know, a few thousand dollars for for rehab because he ended up in the nursing home. The nursing home didn't, you know, Medicare doesn't pay for the nursing home. He lost all of his money or would have lost all of his money if he didn't come and see us. We managed to protect him. Now, what's the difference? They're both brothers. One had a massive heart attack, Medicare paid for. One had dementia, Medicare doesn't pay for. It's, you know, I, I'm not going to be on my soapbox, but it's not right. 
So my goal is to help you and your loved ones want to protect your assets. How can we protect your assets from the nursing home? We also want to avoid probate. That's when we're setting up the revocable trust. Even the irrevocable trust avoid probate. Also, you know, setting up your healthcare power of attorney because we want to honor your healthcare decisions. Um, you know, sometimes we call it living wills, advanced directives, medical directives. Saying so, if I have a terminal condition. I'm saying, I do not want to be hooked up to machines. Just let me go, but provide me comfort care. You've got to put that in writing. I don't know if you remember many years ago down in Florida, there was Terry Schiavo. There was a Terry Schiavo case that they were going all the way up to the Supreme Court to find out what her wishes were or if she had any wishes. You don't want to be in that situation. So you want to decide what your decisions are. We're trying to maintain your quality of life as best we can, whether it's going to be in the nursing home, because maybe you want cable TV, maybe you want a big screen TV, maybe you need glasses or hearing aids. What, what type of life would you have if you don't have any assets you know, to provide that quality of care? Or you want your loved one to maintain a quality of life even though that you're in the nursing home. What happens if you want to leave a legacy for your children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren? The only way that you can do that is coming up with a plan. Because if you end up going into a nursing home, you can lose everything. And the other thing is giving you peace of mind. I can't tell you how many people leave our office once we've come up with plans and documents say, Phew, now we have a plan. You know, I, I can rest. I can rest. Okay? So... What can you do now to plan for the future, to protect your assets, to try and ensure your quality of life, is that we can set up an appointment for you. So the appointment will be that you know we'll meet with you. You can ask me questions, I'll ask you questions, and if something, you know, if it's right, you want to go forward, then we can design a plan for your needs, whether you know, come out with the asset protection plan, irrevocable trust, or maybe you're in a crisis. So we're here to help you. Now, since you've attended this seminar or with Zoom or webinar, whatever we want, we want to call it, we, we call it a fancy title called an educational credit. So basically then we would be giving you a free initial consultation because you've attended this, um, this webinar, this Zoom meeting. And then basically, you know, that... Uh, you know, people say, well, what, what's your fee for doing this? And I says, well, I don't really know until we know what we're going to do for you. you know, I mean, is it just setting up a financial power of attorney? Is we, are we just setting up a will? Are we setting up a neurovocable trust? Are we, uh, you know, doing Medicaid for you? So basically then once we review everything, you know, the initial consultation, we can discuss our fees. Now our fees, what we do is not an hourly basis we would quote you what we call a lump sum fee. So to do X, we're going to say it's X dollars. It's not like you're walking away and saying, hey, is this $10 or is it $400 or is it $50,000? Well, I can assure you it's not going to be $50,000. But, uh, you know, so that's where we discuss our fees. Okay. So that's basically it. Thank you so much for, for listening. I know I sort of talked a lot. Um, I talked a little, yeah, that's not too bad. I talked a little bit longer than I wanted to, but I, I feel that this is really, really important information. Okay, so I think what we'll do, Kristen, is if we can open it up and find out if there's any uh, chat room questions or if anybody has any questions. So, does anybody? any questions or chat room questions I don't have any questions specifically to discuss here but I definitely have a couple different issues going on that I would like to set an appointment with you and discuss one is my mom who is ready to go into a nursing home who's now in assisted living and we've sure. gone through all the money and the other is me 
Um, I'm getting at retirement age, I'm single, I have assets and I wanna protect them. So I have two different issues to meet with you about. Yeah, I totally understand. So what we'll do is that, um, you know, Kristen, you know, who, who's on here is the mm -hmm. office manager taking, mm -hmm. helping me through this. Uh, we'll probably be um, you know, sending you um, some information. You know, we'll, we'll send you a copy of this or a recording of this, uh, this and re reach out to you. Okay. Yes, I'll be following up with everyone that attended, uh, as well as sending them a recording so they can watch it again. Uh, also, like Mr. Wingate said, to set up uh, anyone that is interested, uh, the free initial telephone consultation. So you'll be able to go more in depth with, with your questions as he was explaining. Okay. I do have one other question, David. If, yeah. if I already have a will and power of attorney and that sort of thing, should I have everything available for you? These yeah. were done years, years ago and things have changed with me, obviously. So right. we may need to change some of those. Yeah. So, you know, you know, what we'll do is that you, you know, when we have the appointment, um, you know, if you can send those documents to me, I will review them. And let's say, you know, your, your power of attorneys are fine, you know, financial and medical and your wills are fine. I'm going to tell you they're fine. Okay. We're not going to recreate them, but obviously if they're out of date, um, you know, with the financial power of attorney or the medical power of attorney, or you want to change who your agents are, then obviously we'll have to do new ones. Or, you know, with the will, it's forcing you through to probate and say, well, I don't want to go through probate. I want to do, you know, a revocable trust. Then obviously we'd have to update those documents as well. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Yes. Um, my husband and I are going through the whole process of getting my mother-in-law qualified for Medicaid. And we just had to go um, and get her bank account under the $2,500. Sure. Um, we have to go to the nursing home now and they want us to sign a contract. So mm -hmm. uh, now that you mentioned the contract, I'm a little afraid of what we'll be signing and if we'll be responsible for you know anything that comes up in the future for her he yeah. is the financial power of attorney so i think you said something about if he signs his power of attorney he's signing as her so she would be responsible and he would not be responsible that's correct because he's working for mom as her agent okay because he's the power of attorney so make sure if when you sign the nursing home contract anything that you do you know for your mother you know for his mother or your mother-in-law is you always put poa after your name okay so now you're working as a power of attorney so that means that you personally are not responsible now, if he signs the nursing home contract saying that he is the guarantor, solely the guarantor, then that exposes you guys, you know, to the money. You want to sign it as the power of attorney, as the agent, not as the guarantor. Okay. Now, it's good that you have the power of attorney. You can't just go into, uh, you know, the nursing home and sign the uh, nursing home contract and put POA after your name if you don't have a financial power of attorney, okay? So you, di you, you have to have the financial power of attorney to put POA after your name. Okay, we have that. We have that, that. Your question? Okay. And then, so that was one question. And then the second question kind of goes along with what um, Deb was saying. Um, we have a will, we have, um, you know, the health care directive. Mm -hmm. um, so if we have all of that, that doesn't mean that we're protected against uh, Medicaid or the nursing home getting everything. Right. No, no. So if you have a will and, you know, just the power of attorneys, uh, you're, you're not protected at all. Um, so that's where you have to come up with these trusts or it, God forbid you ended up in a nursing home. Um, then there is ways, you know, 
to protect those assets. Like say that you were, uh, I think you were mentioning your mother-in-law. So if you're part of that spend down, let's say your mother-in-law has uh, $200,000, then you're going to have to spend that $200,000 on the, uh, the nursing home to spend it down below 2,500. But that's where we can come in. Instead of spending that two hundred thousand dollars on the nursing home, we can, as a single person, we can usually save up approximately fifty percent. We could save about a hundred thousand dollars. Now, if your mother-in-law with the two hundred thousand dollars was married, um, you know we could save a hundred percent of that two hundred thousand dollars. Mm. So you don't have to spend all that money down on the nursing home. Yeah, we've already done that. Yeah. Um, so she has nothing left but twenty three hundred dollars. So we've yep. we've Please. already done that. She yeah. and actually was moved into the nursing home yesterday. So right. when I saw this online, it was like, oh boy, this is you know exactly what we're going through. Yeah. And you know, my husband and I do have assets. We do have a home. We do have mm -hmm. you know other things and. I don't want to, you know, I don't want the nursing home to get it. So sure. I want my kids to get it. No, no, I get it. Yeah, that, that's what we try and do, okay? Because as you say, like, look at your mother-in-law, she has 2,300 bucks, she'll go on Medicaid. But Medicaid, you know, like Medicare, doesn't pay for glasses, doesn't pay, you know, she gets $83 a month. What the heck can, no, I don't mean to be, you know, but the time she gets her, you know, her hair done and everything like that, that 83 bucks is gone, you know? Yeah. How is she going to pay for cable? How is she going to pay for teeth? That's going to have to come out of your pocket. Okay. Okay. You know, you know to protect your, as my client said, you know, her stuff. You know, how can we protect my stuff? Um, you know, give us a shout and we can show you. And, and what you're saying is you can protect our stuff. You can protect our house and mm -hmm. any other assets from going to a nursing home. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can start off, you know, with, you know, because, you know, with the pre-crisis, you know, setting up a pre-crisis asset protection plan, but, you know, God forbid that you, you or your husband went into a nursing home tomorrow, uh, depending on what assets you have, et cetera, we could usually protect a hundred percent okay and that would be with a like an irre irrevocable trust right the irrevocable trust is our pre-crisis planning yes yes okay. not the irrevocable trust doesn't really work for the uh, crisis planning there's there's other strategies okay typically um, I have a question about a durable power of attorney. I have one and I enlisted my husband as agent if something happened to me with my sons as backup. My sure. husband has since died. So is my durable power of attorney still good because I had my sons named as the backup? Yeah, yeah, because then your sons take over from your husband because your husband is, I'm sorry, that, um, you know, he's not alive anymore. So the only thing I would probably do is that, you know, if you have a copy of the death certificate, I would just attach the death, you know, copy of the death certificate to the back of it because, you know, God forbid something happened to you, they're going to be looking for your husband, okay? Right, right. And okay, okay well, if it's gone, then it goes down the next, next in line to your son or sons. Okay, thank you. My other question is, how are you handling all of this with COVID? Is this an in-person meeting? Is this, how are you doing this? Yeah, that's, that's you know, <laughs> that's a very good question that uh, we're learning a lot that, um, well, obviously, you know, even these presentations, we used to, you know, do them in person uh, presentations. Now we're doing them over Zoom. So um, with the appointments for, for most of our clientele, what, what we're doing is that we're doing it either over a Zoom or doing it over the telephone. Um, there is some clients that do want to come into the office and sit down and speak, but I would say, you know, 95, 96%, you know, we're doing it over Zoom or telephone. 
uh, we go over all of the information. Now, if you do want to come into the office, then that's fine. You know, we sanitize everything down. You have to wear masks. We wear masks, and every, you know, we 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 do all the appropriate CDC uh, you know measures. And then it's sort of um, it's, you know to me, it's very impersonal. You know, doing it over the zooms or over the yeah, telephone, but you know we have to do what we have to do. So it's basically up to you guys. We're doing most of our work. Like say we're going to do uh, a power of attorney for you. You know, we would have the, you know, have the call. We would take the information down. Then we draft up the documents. What we're doing is then sending you the documents and then having a telephone or a Zoom going through the documents with you to make sure you understand, you know, what we're doing. And then what we're doing is what we call them drive-bys. They're like a, you know, sometimes it's like a drug deal, like in the summer, or it's getting a little chilly now. But you know, you drive up to the office, you stay in the car. We would have our masks on, go out to the car, and see you sign the documents and bring them back in. And you would leave. We, you know, we prepare them and put them in a binder. Then you swing back a later date to pick up your binder um, but it's getting a little chilly uh, so sometimes we're we're meeting you outside of the office you know uh, uh, you know um in in the building you know we've got a couple of chairs now because uh me and Kristen are you know we don't like the cold or the wet or the snow or the ice where are you located uh we we have offices in uh Hagerstown, Frederick and uh, in Montgomery County. The main office is in Frederick. Right. We're on, in Frederick, our office is in Thomas Johnson Drive. Perfect. If you're familiar with there. So if you're coming up the Possum Town Pike, Pike, and then you turn right onto Thomas Johnson, there's the brown brick building. Yes. The dentist building. That's where we are, right across from the uh, Roy Rogers and uh, Walgreens. We're right there. Okay. Where all the doctors are. <laughs> okay, so it's a free consultation. We bring what we have, and then if there is additional paperwork that needs to be done, then we talk fees. That's correct, yep. Okay. All right. So how do we schedule an appointment? Uh, you can give us a call or, you know, as I say, that Kristen uh, will be reaching out to you, um, you know, after after this. And, um, you know, if, then you can just set up an appointment. You know, what we do is that, you know, you can send the documents. Uh, we can send you a questionnaire, you know, regarding your the estate planning and, uh, you know, what assets you have. Yes, I'll be following up with everyone when this is over. We can go ahead and set up the free initial telephone consultations, uh, as well as getting questionnaires off to anyone that's interested. Uh, and then we, we take it from there. But I will definitely follow up with everyone this afternoon and uh, get you on the schedule as soon as you'd like. That's great. Thank you. So I have a question, Dave, <clears throat> regarding a rental property. Mm -hmm. uh, is it wise to put a rental property in a uh, revocable living trust? And uh, would that person be able to use the um, income from that rental property without being, you know, considered uh, income in that 2,500? Yeah. Um, if, if you put it into, you were talking about the, I think we were meaning if you were putting into a irrevocable trust. Uh, because the revocable trust doesn't protect the assets. Okay? I see. So it would have to go into, if you put it into a irrevocable trust in, in Maryland, you're not allowed to get the income stream from that. So it becomes a little bit problematic. But there's ways that the income stream, you know, from the, the rental property, you know, there's ways to protect that rental property without it being in a irrevocable trust, okay? Okay, and does the trust have to be created in the state in which the rental property exists? 
Uh, no, no. It's like, let's say, you know, we, we have properties here. So let's say we set up the trust here and there's a, you know, you have a rental property in uh, Delaware or Rehoboth or whatever. Uh, you can transfer the rental property from Delaware in, into the trust. Because if you've got a rental property over in Delaware and a house here in Maryland, you're going to have two probates, one in Delaware when you die and one here. So if you put it into the trusts, you don't have to have probate, two probates. Okay. Okay. And you mentioned the uh, divorce situation and protecting assets. Mm -hmm. So if you have a child who gets married, uh, and you want to protect, we'll say, that rental property. Uh, in the event that that child gets divorced, how can that be protected? Is it through a trust? Right. So let's say that we have the, uh, you know, I've got my daughter-in-law, okay, and I don't like my daughter-in-law. So if I've, I've got my, you know, so I've set up a trust, and let's say I've got $200,000 set aside for my son. And it's in the trust. So, however, you know, that because I don't like my daughter-in-law, I, you know, when I die, I don't want that $200,000 going directly to my son, you know, out of the trust. So now he has hold of it because God forbid that he dies and he has a will or a trust and he gives it to my daughter-in-law. I don't want that happening. So what I've done is I've set up, um, that $200,000 in the trust. So if I die, that $200,000 stays in the trust for the benefit of my son. Now, if he dies and doesn't use all of that $200,000, it doesn't go to my daughter-in-law or if, if she's, if we're, you know, divorced, it would go down to my grandkids. I see. So there's, there's different ways you know, of setting different things up. And it's like, you know, sometimes that, you know, we have clients with, with kids or grandkids or get problems with drugs, alcohol, spendthrift, you know, so I don't want to give that $200,000 to, you know, someone who is a drug addict, you know? Um, yeah. So, you know, we can keep that $200,000 in the trust and give Jimmy 50 bucks a week, you know, for the rest mm -hmm. of his life. You know? if, if you have uh, two properties, one in, as you pointed out, Delaware, one in West Virginia, can they, do you need two separate uh, revocable trusts or no. irrevocable trusts? No. So let's say that you set one up here in Maryland, then you can transfer the Delaware property into the revocable trust and you can transfer the West Virginia property into the revocable trust. Same one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Do you, did you say you had an office in Frederick? Yes. Yeah. That's the main office. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, can I ask Thank you me. about an irrevocable trust? Does everything, if you set one up, does everything have to remain in that until you die? Like if I put my house in there and X number of dollars and I'm in a nursing home and at some point in time, my son wants to sell the house, can he sell the house or can it, everything, it can't be sold until I die? R yes. Um, so let's say that you set up the irrevocable trust and move your, your residence into that, uh, the irrevocable trust. Yes, down the road that your son, who if he's the trustee, can sell that home. And let's say your home's worth $300,000. Now we take that, you know, we keep it in the trust, but now we sell that $300,000 piece of property. Now we've got $300,000 cash inside of the trust that he could invest that in stocks, bonds, or, or whatever, or just CDs. So yes, he can, he can sell it. Um, but the money has to stay in the trust. I would keep that money in the trust because if he takes it out and gives it to you, you're back to square one again. Now you have the $300,000. He, can he sell it and he take the money? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that'd be breaching his duty as the trustee. So okay. I, I don't mean this badly, you know, but if you don't trust your son, don't make him trustee. Oh, no, I trust him. But yeah. No, 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 I understand, but you know. Yeah, I was just asking, could that money benefit him? Let's just say he needed money at that yeah, point in his life. Of, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut, cut over. 
But um, yeah, if there's ways of that he needs the money, he could take the money out. Or even there's, let's say that you needed a big screen TV and you need to you know, spend 3,000 bucks on a big screen TV. There is ways of him taking it out and buying you a big screen TV. Okay. okay. So choosing a trustee, I heard somewhere it has to be an arm's length person, but you're saying that you could choose a relative if you wanted to do that. Yes, yes. It can, you know, it, I, you know I can't set up an irrevocable trust and appoint my wife as the, uh, the trustee. It, you know, it can be kids, it could be nieces, nephews, you know, siblings, professional trustees, you know, because, you know, I, I'm not a great fan of professional trustees like banks or, you know, financial yeah. because then they're taking, you know, double dipping on fees. Right, right. But sometimes... So it can, it can be a relative. It can be a relative, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the question, let's say you did have that and you appoint your son as the trustee and, on this rental property I was mentioning... And he receives the money, um, you know, uh, from the rental. Can he pay your bills if you're in a nursing home? Uh, well, you, you don't want him to pay your bills if you're in a nursing home because you, oh, oh, you want oh, the to pay for it, you know. But yeah, yeah. I mean, so let's say that I set up a trust. My, you know, my my son is the trustee. He can take that money out you know, for his benefit, it, but that money goes to him, then he yeah. can do whatever he wants with that money. I so see. If, I, if I turn around to him and say, hey, you know what, I need, I need uh, a new coffee pot, you know, in, in my nursing home room, he can run out and buy a coffee pot, you know. Okay. And, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to put you on a spot here, but mm -hmm. can you give us a range of, uh, uh, what it would cost to to engage your services just a range a low and a high i i, I hear what you're saying uh i don't like doing that because i get into trouble one time because i uh you know let's say i i said it was going to be you know 50 bucks to do a will and then the client came in and says well i want the trust and you said it was going to be 50 bucks i said well i said it was a 50 bucks for a will not 50 bucks for a trust right so that's why we do this initial consultation to find out, you know, um, you know, what you have, what, what you need. And then that's when I, you know, I can quote you a fee there. Okay. All right. So you, you would quote on the initial consultation, which is a freebie, you would quote a price at that point. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as long as we, you know, the, all the, you know, so let's say that you wanted to do, uh, you know, um, you know, financial power of attorney, medical power of attorney, and do a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust, and we look at everything. I can quote you a fee on that. Yes. Okay. Now, if I had a, uh, a medical power of attorney done five years ago, mm -hmm. uh, would you say I should have a? Would you want to refresh that, or can I just use that one I have? I, you know, I would look at it and tell you, um, you know, my opinion on it, because not all power of attorneys are created equal. Um, you know, so I mean, if it's fine, uh, I, I will tell you, you know, or, if, you know, if I, you know, if I think that you should change it, I will tell you, uh, then you can make that choice. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Well, if not, thank you all for, for listening. And uh, it was sort of nice meeting you all through the uh, whatever we meet <laughs> through the <laughs> Zoom or cloud or wh whatever it is. And if we can help you in any way, please get in contact with us. Okay. Yeah.